wrestling fans around the corner around the world. I'm Dan Marotti along with MJ in the house, otherwise known as that rocker, Marty Jannetty. I know it's getting cool out, but it's not quite Halloween yet. We'll be back with a brand new Wrestling Insiders Party with Marty next. This is Mick Foley. This is Harley Race. This is Shelton Benjamin. This is Mr. Wonderful Paul Orndorff. This is the Monster Abyss. And this is Daniel Bryan. This is JBL, and you're watching the MWF. Be there live. Wrestling fans around the corner, around the world, it's Thursday night. It's 9 p.m. That must mean it's Wrestling Insiders. Potty with Marty along with... MJ in the house, otherwise known as that rocker, Marty Jannetty. If you know how many times we have to do these introductions every time we take, <laughs> because it's the only way we can afford to put them together at this point until you find folks uh, help the cause more by subscribing, giving us the thumbs up, using that super chat button below when you watch the live premieres, along with the great merchandise, Marty. It's always great to have you here on Thursday night. We've been having a lot of fun as we continue to grow this project of ours. I'm just wondering what the date is. So do I. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I know it's getting cool, though. We're probably It's probably a little after my birthday. So I was going to say, because, you know, the big four time, time just shows, because this is, this is not live. This is recorded like maybe a week or two or three or five earlier. And so they may not even be wearing these things by then when this show There may shows. not be a virus. Yeah. COVID-20 may have hit. But, uh... <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> and you know, another thing I've yeah. noticed, um, what do you you know, notice? you know, we're spending a lot of time here in the studio, and, and you know, this is my second, third, fourth, fifth time here. I, do, do women, like the girls, get in this industry? You don't want to see the woman that works here. There are some here? Are you familiar with the, the nursery or the kid's story, Rapunzel? <laughs> yeah, I've when heard about it. They stick the hair out the window and the guy climbs in. She's oh, actually yeah. able to do that with another oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, area boy. of hair. Damn. It's that long and thick. Why do you know that? Well, they call her fluffy. Okay. When she wears shorts in the summertime, it kind of looks like she's got a mini skirt under the skirt. Damn. You know what I mean? It's kind of long. Bring her a weed whacker. Well, we'd have to talk to our good <coughs> friend in the control room, Ralph Owens, about that. He's actually used to fantasize about her as a teenager. He thought she was a MILF, Fluffy Guerrero. <coughs> Damn. <coughs> Corona. When B, when I'm, B, I'm bringing it. You know, when, I got accused when, after that silly ass murder thing. Then I got accused of bombing Vince's the uh, uh, limo. Then I got accused of causing, uh, spreading the virus. <laughs> I'm the one that brought it here to the states. When Beefcake comes into the studio, he may have to give her a trim downstairs. You know what I mean? Oh, he back but on he'd that. Need, he'd need the big, the big clippers for that one. There's a lot of bush, baby. Yeah, That's boy. all right. The 70s never ended for her. <coughs> all right, wrestling fans, as we continue, uh, the voyage of the Rockies, Shawn Michaels and Marty Jannetty in 1988, two young guys taking the world by storm. They run in the territory coast to coast, working with the Conquistadors on a regular basis. Yep. There was also another debuting babyface tag team at that time, Jumping Ship uh, from the NWA down south. It was Warlord and the Barbarian managed for a very brief time by the Baron, better known as Baron Von Raschke. I didn't know that. I know Fuji was with him. That was it's, that started at Survivor Series in November. Oh, okay. But for the first month or two, they had Baron, Baron Von Raschke with uh, like a hoodie type hood over his head. Oh, not that's covered, right. Yeah, but. I remember now. Yeah, and that was a uh, man working with them. I think here's how it went. We started with uh, Conquistadors, and they were great to you know also get us adjusted to, um, to the company, acclimated to the differences in WWF at the time in AWA where we'd come from. Oh my God, was it different. And, uh, you know, so it, it kind of got us in there, broke us in there and learned everything. And, and plus our wrestling skills, you know, and timing. And the biggest thing about wrestling is psychology, crowd psychology. Um, you know, I mean, you can know all, all the moves in the world, but if you don't know when or why to use them, it, it's no good. Um, it's just the whole purpose is psychology. When I do my seminars now, um, when I first started, I, you know, gung ho, loved getting in there and hands on training, um, show a couple new flips and whatever else, you know, fancy moves. But as I continued doing the seminars, it, it got to where, you know, they, they can learn this stuff in school. I mean, I'm only here once. So let me teach them what they're not going to learn in school. Uh, like you and I were talking about some trainers, because they can do an arm drag slam, suplex, you know, all, you know 
now they're qualified to train. Uh, Would you have someone that read a book once in their life become a college professor all of a sudden? Yeah. yeah. And, and psychology is the part that's missing in most schools. Now, down there where they're at now, you know, I think Sean's helping out with NXT. Um, we're going to see them later. Right. Well, not tonight. The night we're taping this right. was the night of NXT 30. Yeah, okay. Before SummerSlam. So we're going to get a good look at the, that's their 30th takeover. They Damn. run them almost like Clash of the Champions in WCW. Once a quarter with WWE's big pay-per-views. Uh, that's a lot of quarters. But, uh, <laughs> yeah, so, um, you know, psychology is a big part of it. Uh, and that's what we were learning more and more of with Conquistadors. Then we thought, okay, you know, we had a, about a year and a half run with Buddy Rose and Doug Summers and Sherry Martell. Oh, yeah, AWA. Uh, yeah. And it was some good matches and, you know, kicked uh, blow, the blow-off was that damn blood match. It was, Sometimes still gets talked about. Oh, my God. You know, we're going to do a couple of episodes about AWA as time goes on. But I remember just as that was right around the time I started watching wrestling. And I remember those matches on ESPN, That the blood. Oh, my God. Yeah, man. We, you all, guys lit it up. All four of us and even Sherry tried to. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, yeah, um, <clears throat> we thought we were like, okay, we know what we're doing now. We just had a year and a half run with Buddy and Doug, which were, and they were great teachers, great workers. And um, then we got with the Conquistadors and adjusted a little more. It was more, again, getting acclimated to a different company uh, and their, what they like and what they don't like. What The fans were even a little different, um, for whatever reason that is. Maybe because when you got a sold-out arena of 18,000 people, they react a little different than when you're in a place with two or 3,000 people. Mm -hmm. uh, I guess. I, I did that, I don't know. But... Um, the, the, the next, you know, as we were thinking, yeah, we got this. We just, Bud, uh, Buddy and Doug, Conquistadors, yeah, we're good. Then we got with the Brain Busters. That was your second big house show run was with the Brain Busters. Yeah. That started in late 88. I want to get there because I saw that live and in person, and that was just great. I mean, that's about as good as tag team wrestling as you're going to yeah, see. I, mean, I would put that on par with a couple of years before at the Garden. They had a couple of months of the Bulldogs and the Hot Foundation, and those were excellent, too. Yeah. And I would put what you guys did, at least in Boston, and some of the televised, I saw the MSG one, which was considered a classic from early 89. That that was a clinic in what it, tag team wrestling is supposed yeah. to be. And boy, did we learn every night. It, it was it was how to up the intensity as the match goes, which is something we, we had not, really, we were just used to the standard um, baby face shine, get the heat, make the comeback, and go home. But then when we got with Tully and Arn, Tully Blanchard and Arn Anderson, um, man, it, it, we learned like you take it from this level of intensity, take it up a little more in intensity, and then you get it to this level of intensity, which was usually where we all four brawl and all end up squared off with each other, you know, and, and they, they usually got it pop from the crowd because like, wow, these guys are serious. Great program. I, I have some in-depth questions about that once we move forward a little bit into the next year, but that, what a great, probably a four month run you had every night on yeah. those house shows. Why that couldn't have been presented at WrestleMania, I don't know, but we'll get to 1989 in a little bit, but any early memories of the Powers of Pain and the, well, the Baron when, was when, there for about as long as you I were in 1987. <laughs> I don't remember much of, of, of uh, you weren't working with them, yeah. Yeah, we started working with them when Fuji was with them. And you know, at first, just like WrestleMania five scared me and Sean to death. And, and I say that because as our first WrestleMania, and we got this new team put together, the Twin Towers. It was six foot seven, Akeem the African Dream, which was one man gang originally, and a big boss man, who's like six six, you know, big old boy, and here's our little asses, five eleven and six foot tall, two hundred and thirty pounds. <laughs> These guys are three seventy five, three fifty, six foot. We're the littlest guys in the company, and. I'm drifting off, ain't I? Yeah. You've changed, bro. What? <laughs> <laughs> I haven't even changed my clothes. What are you talking about? <laughs> they, uh, yeah, why don't you do that? Well, it's coming up soon. That'll be the, <laughs> yeah. for November I sweeps. didn't really either. Look, I've done every combination I can. For I'll November put the shirt sweeps. over, the, the shirt under. What's that shirt say? I can't read it. What does it say? Uh, donate blood. Donate blood. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a worthy cause. I try to do it nightly. <laughs> but um, yeah, uh, uh, we had the, the um, Twin Towers, right? At WrestleMania Five in '89. Yeah, yeah. It, it, we're just saying with the Warlord and them, it was a similar feeling. It was like, 
Gosh, damn. I mean, the two biggest guys in the company, it's our first WrestleMania. I'm talking about the Twin Towers again, Boss Man and Hakeem, the African Dream. And me and Sean's little asses. And we're like, man, <laughs> how are we going to make this work? But somehow it ended up working. I think we did something that you still haven't seen, not even in Japan, was the double drop kicks from the top rope on Boss yeah, Man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We, uh, you know, Sean on one side, me yep. on the other. When that was a good spot. Drop kick the uh, boss man in the middle. Um, I've seen a couple of guys try it before. <laughs> it's real embarrassing when it don't, it don't work. Get yeah, that uh, great timing for that. Yeah. Or yeah, because even in ours, I think one of us got there a little before the other. And the other one kind of almost shot over, but, you know, scraped enough. But Did you have... Uh, but with oh, Warlord... Sorry. Well, no, I was just comparing it to you know, Warlord and Barbarian. Now, now you got guys that are, they're not six seven and six eight, you know, six, but they're right six five, six big, four. Big boys. Yeah, and and they're muscled up. They're not just you know big bodies. They're muscled. I mean, Warlord was three thirty and not probably five percent body fat, if wow. that. I mean, you know, and Barbarians just as just as built and and. Here we are again, <laughs> what are we going to do with that? But we learned how to work with the big guys like that. And uh, we had, I love those matches. So we, we went around with them. You had a, you had a feud months. with them about, about a year and a half later. You had a program in yeah. early 90 with them. But it, at that point in 88, did you think to yourselves, okay, we're new, we're a babyface tag team. And in comes a huge babyface tag team. In Warlord and Barbarian, did you th wonder where you may wind up in the shuffle with this new team coming in? Or? No, we got lost on that. We we were just so focused on our work. You know, a lot of a lot of the guys are that way. Um, like every everybody's a threat to their meal. <laughs> you know, everybody coming in is is going to get their money. Um, Sean and I was never like that. We just wanted to, what we had, and make it as good as we could make it. Um, and that's really what the guy should do. Focus on your own work. Don't worry about somebody else's. It'll all work out in the end the way it's supposed to. Um, I, or at least that's in my opinion. Uh, another newcomer in the summer of 1988, a man we've spoken about a few times on the show, maybe not too in-depth. Were you happy to see Mr. Perfect Kurt Henning join you in? Oh, he, before he was, he was just Kurt Henning when he came in in 1988. Yeah, he, uh, yeah, he, was, he was perfect, man. He was <laughs> no pun intended. Yeah. He was, uh, was, you know, we were all, we were a tight-knit family over there. Me, Scott Hall, Kurt, and Sean. Um, you know, we had a, you know, we had to grow, grow, we grew together, you know, in, in the business. Kurt probably had to jump on us because his dad, you know, he had his dad to learn from. Um, that might be why he was so good, man. He's, to me, Kurt, if I had to do an all-time greats, that would be number one on that list. You think Kurt Henning is the greatest wrestler in wrestling history. Yeah, now, why yeah. is that? Because the guy knew exactly what he was doing psychology-wise. He was so easy to work with. He was fluid like water. He was, you know, everywhere. The psychology, like we said, is, was unbelievably perfect, spot on. And he's so athletic, man. The guy used to have, we, we said he got springs in his calves. He could just bounce across the ring on one foot like, like a damn deer. You know, jump over the top rope, uh, you know, from a, from a bump that almost in the middle of the ring. Um, just athletically, the whole package. He was pretty good on the mic, too, you know. And it, and always, yeah, no, he was a good interview. Yeah. They, they say, you know, the three things needed is a body, the work, and the microphone skills. And he had all three. You know, if you got two out of three, you'll do all right. If you got one out of three, you're going to have to work some. But if you got all three, you're going to do good. And uh, he had all three, and he was excellent at each one of them, at each one of the skills. And I can't think, as I sit here pondering what you just said, I can't think of a bad match the, bad, the man ever had. Probably didn't have one. Yeah. Uh, nah, he's, I can't think of one either. <laughs> uh, no, he, he, he lived the moniker as time went on, but uh, any memories of Kurt when he first came into the company? Was he happy to be there? Was he reluctant where he was... Wasn't a giant in a time well, when the giants were really yeah, being he pushed. Was, he was, you know, like I said, he had his dad to teach him, yeah. you know, everything. So he'd come in prepared. That's he was confident. That's generally, again, what I always talk about when I teach my kids. Um, that's that's it's preparation. Once you're actually at the show, you've already put the work in. Now go enjoy the benefits, you know. Um, <clears throat> he was prepared when he came in. He was he was ready, you know. And I'm sure, like I said, it's 
his father had a lot to do with that. But he, um, you know, he came right in, stepped right in place, like he belonged there. And that's, he had a great run. That's the way you do it. You, you, you come in there like you belong there. Um, yeah, he, uh, and everybody loved Kurt. Kurt was like a man, you know, that saying, the man's man, you know. The guys just loved him, you know, and, and uh, he was another one that was, I was going to say pretty faithful, but faithful as far as, you know, he didn't ever do anything on the road with the, with the women. He'd cut up, you know, it'd be, you know, he'd be with the boys hanging out and cutting up, and, you know, but he, I, I don't remember ever seeing him bring a girl back to the room or, you know, hugging and kissing all over one or anything, and maybe I'm wrong, maybe I missed it, but I don't think so. But um, yeah, he, uh, yeah, I loved Kurt to death. That was one of them phone calls that that actually tore me up too. I remember the weekend that it happened. Percy Paul Bearer was with us, and that was that was a tough one for him. Yeah, it that was, was February of '03. Uh, Kurt Kurt got the unique position of being one of the boys working and all that, and to work in the office. He was sort of an agent, or he was in the, included in the booking. Uh, oh, meeting. really? Yeah. And that early on in 88 or yeah, as time went on? Yeah, that's probably around 90-ish. Okay. Um, you know, he came to me and he goes, Janetti? Or he called me Giretti because uh, Stan Hansen used to call me. It. Couldn't, he, he thought it was Giretti. So Kurt, you know, cut up and Giretti. He goes, I don't want the boys to think that I'm company. You know, I want the boys to know I'm still them. So I'm going to do this and I'm going to do that. So he would go into the meetings and battle for the boys. Really? And, and, yeah. And, and he, I never knew that. Yeah. Because uh, he, he didn't want to be looked at as a company man, you know, um, and he wanted to always be one of the boys. He didn't, you know, he didn't want to be an office boy. But uh, they were they were a great family. I got to know Larry and Irene, his parents, well, and Irene is just one of the nicest ladies. I was really sad because Larry was with us in New Orleans in 2018, so probably six months or so before he passed away. And so many of the guys came over to pay their respects to him, Bill and Barry. Uh, X-Pac came over, the Nasty Boys came over to sit with him, and you could tell he was kind of slipping. Yeah. So I think it meant a lot to him to be there, you know yeah. what I mean? And did you ever see his son wrestle? Yeah, a couple times. What yeah. did you think of him? I, I thought he was good, you know, I, I, it was like, you can't miss this Curtis boy, you know? Yeah. Uh, you had to get some of the genes, you know, and... Um, but I don't know what happened. He was there and then we didn't see him no more. WWE know. released him back in April. I wonder why that When they was. released, my God, 20 or so guys during the... Oh, you mean the, recent April? Th this year, yeah. Oh, great. they cleaned house because of COVID because gave Because of the many, virus. Yeah, yeah. gave them an a, a excuse. Well, I remember Irene said he's been a very, very, very smart man with his money, so hopefully he's enjoying life up in Minnesota, wherever his travels may take him, I'm sure. Robbinsdale. <laughs> Once life gets back to normal with so many national promotions out there now between AEW... Ring of Honor, TNA, even Major League Ring Wrestling and NWA. Around. What's that now? Ring of Honor still around? Uh, they have some pulse, yeah. It's just, uh, I don't know, after 18 years or so, it, it just it seems like it's never got traction to become a mainstream promotion. Yeah, I don't know why it is, because they had great talent. And they're owned by a, a great television outlet by in Sinclair, you know what I mean? Yeah. They have television outlets all over the country, but you can't find the show at the same time the same day every week, and I think that that well, that makes them. a big difference. Big deal. Be even impact. This is like changing a venue where you wrestle every Wednesday yeah. night, and then you. Well, now we're going to be over there in the armory. Some weeks it's Thursday, some weeks it's Saturday. You'd never be able yeah, to commit that's to no it. Good. Yeah. Uh, what about Chikara? Chikara? Uh, I don't. Uh, you know, I don't want it because I'm not 100 percent sure. Well, that's not stopped you before. Well, because it's it's kind of a sensitive subject that came up over oh, some okay, of the, the social media okay, never mind. I'm sorry. Uh, attacks over the past few months. I'm not 100% sure if they were included in something, okay. and I don't want to put that. I know what you're talking about, If too. they're innocent people, you know what I mean? Yeah, Why I know, include I know them I know what you're that? talking about. I, the owner, man, I, I love him to death. Um, but, yeah, I heard, I heard what you heard. Okay, so, yeah, we're talking yeah. the same thing. Then. So I, I don't know what their future yeah, is going to be. Not good, probably. Is this vodka? That's it's uh, polar water. Polar is, I think, a Worcester brand. This might not be vodka, <laughs> but you hope it is. <laughs> that's that's where I'm gonna get a T-shirt. I'm gonna start selling. This might not be. Then you can put whatever you want. I might it. not be an orgasm donor. <laughs> <laughs> you did spike it. I, all right, sorry. Uh, it was like that plane ride from San Francisco to Dallas. But wow. anyway. Uh, another debut, and the, they were handcuffed. And they were, oh, they were in the wheelchair handcuffed. Off, yeah. see, that's that. how you knew they were going to jail. 
They were in trouble. Yeah, they got their hair shaved, heads shaved off, boobs hanging out, and then they went to jail on top of it. <laughs> I just would, would love to have been there when they explained it to their fraternity. What happened to you guys? Oh, can you imagine when they went home to try and explain that? Do you have... Um, hey, that, explain to me how that works. Um, what's that? I'm now? sorry, go finish that. No, I... Well, like, so I learned how to do this. That way I can come be a cameraman. When Howard the, comes out and gives me ten, a 10 minute mock. But he does it like 20 times. Well, that means it's another 10 minutes. So, so like, if, he come, if we see him the second time, that means we're at 20 minutes. If he comes Oh, that's up, going upwards. I'm it's not going coming up. down. Oh, okay. So, Howard, since you're actually part of this program now, we're at about <laughs> the 20 minute mark. Mock. That's Howard, pop, Howard Miller. Pock the car, the garage. Yeah. Does that mean we're around 20? All right, well, we're incorporating you into the show, brother. We're putting you over. Again, I'll say it, he's a good, good, good human being. Not everyone wants them, but when we have some of the, the intern types come through, the good ones, I always offer them a letter of recommendation. What about Glouch? Glantz? Yeah. I, who knows? After that text message, we may see Glantz again. Or as they call him on Tony's show, they spell it wrong. They call him Glontz. <laughs> he had a good he, he texted a while ago. He had a real good reason, though. He, he slept in. He, until 5 o'clock in the afternoon. <laughs> yeah. I had Linda. He'd have been at one of them MJ parties. <laughs> Linda Moratti breaking my balls about a Kobe Bryant jersey that didn't fit the kid, even though I wasn't there to give it to him, and I'm getting heat over that. And we got Glantz saying I slept a little late at 5 p.m. when most people are having dinner. <laughs> what a world we have. But like I said, we got Howard in the back. We got Ralph Owens, a longtime MWF executive. Matt Daddy. We got your buddy Matt Daddy that picked you up at the hotel. We're having a good time. We're talking 1988. We're talking about another character debut as the individual was working at the office previously. It was the debut of brother Bruce love. Pritchard as the Brother Love. Brother Love. The Brother Love, I love Show. Love you. <laughs> Memories of Brother Love <laughs> and in that interesting that show. Ass paint. <laughs> Well, how did he get red? Do you know? I don't know. I don't know if he had bad breath or if um, you know, sunburned. I don't know what happened, but boy, they put that. He was red. Was red. He was red. Pretty much red. I guess had high blood pressure. He drank too much. <laughs> Not Bruce. No, <laughs> I like Bruce, man. Bruce oh, was, Bruce is a longtime friend of the show. We, I think we've talked about how popular his podcast is. Yeah. When he's done live shows, I, I've been the MC for them a few times. I open for them and I go around and get the questions from the fans and Bruce has been great to this show. I I think the world of him. He's a yeah, good I guy. Do too. He was he was he was really good to me while I was there. And he's got hey. one of the toughest jobs in wrestling right now, my God. What's he doing? Executive director of Raw and SmackDown. Really? Yeah. Damn both shows. He worked his way right back to good yeah. job, Bruce. <laughs> Oh, uh, his brother. I can't remember his brother's Tom. name. Tom. Uh, Tom, yeah, Tom, Tom. He was really good, too. Yeah, he was. I would have loved to have seen that tag team, the Heavenly Bodies, him and Jimmy Del Rey, yeah. work with you guys at well, your peaks. Well, one that would have, no, that was well done. Remember, it, it was, who was well done? It was, uh. Timothy Well and Stephen Dunn. Are they both dead now? Yeah. Damn. Sorry, guys. Rest in peace. Love y'all. Two young guys, yeah. Yeah, it's crazy, man. It's crazy. You know, I was telling somebody, now I'm going to get myself in trouble again. These are usually the better stories. <laughs> <laughs> but this one, this, one, this one ain't all that great, but, no. but um, just in my opinion, and, and from my point of view, you know, when all the guys were dying off there, um, I hate to say it that way, dying off, <clears throat> but, um, you know, it was like 70 in a 10-year span. And, and, you know, we talked about that. We, um, you know, hated that phone call when it started out. Did you hear what happened to, and then you just started Fill hoping in it wasn't your inner circle. Fill in the blank. Yeah. And, um, but when that was going on, it, 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 it's not going to fit all of them because I know somebody was saying, well, that didn't happen. That's not the case here. That, not, I'm not saying that. I'm just saying a lot of them. Um, the guys that were partying, doing the recreational drugs, you know, cocaine, whatever, pills. Um, but I don't think weed has ever killed anybody yet. <laughs> I don't think there's one recorded case where a guy OD'd from weed. Might have went to the hospital scared to death that the damn dragons were coming out of the roof. But, <laughs> but um, the guys that were partying, <clears throat> pretty much all were still around. Um, you know, some went way too far with it. Yeah, and it might have, some of them, you know, we kind of would more study on the CTE, which I have real bad. Um, we, we now might be looking at there was maybe there was suicide, maybe it was on purpose. 
It wasn't an accident. There were suicides in a lot of cases. Yeah, there was yeah. a lot of them, yeah. and, and that's CTE. That's a big thing with CTE. Um, and if we get off on that subject, man, <laughs> and I, I, you know, I think I told you before when I first started learning about it and, and finding out, like, oh, damn, there's 13 symptoms. I got seven of them. Wow. I got eight of them. Oh, shit, I got nine of them. And it got down to where I had 10. And uh, the attorney, my attorney called to check on me, see, you know, how I'm doing now. And I said, well, I got 10 of the 12 symptoms. Uh, or was it 11 or 13? I think there's 13 symptoms. So I said, I got 11 of them. <clears throat> and I said, the only two I don't have is uh, the suicidal thoughts and the sudden mood swings. And my girl from this, this is when I was living out in Vegas, my girl I was hanging, hanging with then, she's right there. She goes, oh, yes, he does. <laughs> and he goes, let me talk to her. And I'm like, well, shit, I guess I got 12 of the 13 now then. And she was telling him. And he, he told me, he goes, you need to listen to the people around you because you won't understand that you're going through it. Yeah, so, exactly. You know, so 12 of the 13 and never had the suicidal Good. until recent. <laughs> I don't say that. No, it was just some bad, dark, dark, dark moments. Are you familiar with the work that Chris Nowinski has done with yeah. the concussion legacy yeah. right here in Boston? We I go to the dinner every year, the fundraiser oh, that yeah. they do. It's a great I, thing. It's he's a great the, thing. He's the one that kind of initiated the whole thing, I think. Um, what was the girl's name that, um, shit. I'm sorry, I can't, I'm sorry, sweetie. Um, she was in ECW for a while. Uh, I think she was either Tommy Dreamer's girl. Beulah? Francine? Francine. Okay. Francine. And she's the one that got pregnant too, right? And then wanted to just sue the company for letting her off. Cause that was Don Marie. Don Marie. That's who I'm thinking. Sorry, both of y'all. Sorry for getting that wrong. Please don't hit me next time you see me. But um, I, one of them, I thought, got involved with the CTE thing too. Uh, I'm not familiar with it, not to say that they haven't. But yeah. In, in Boston, every usually late October, early November, they do a great dinner. Our president, Dr. David Reese, has uh, been a big supporter of them, and it's a nice dinner. WWE usually makes a, a pretty big donation and sends in a couple of talents. Oh, do they? And, That's good. Yeah, 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 they become very, I think at first they were kind of an enemy to what he was doing, and then they realized this is something they need to be on board with. It, you know? it, it definitely is, because I'll tell you what, man, once you, if, as far as what I know right now of it, and I can't try to keep up on it since I've got bad cases of it, it's got me doing things that um, I don't understand. Um, they can't fix it yet. No, there, there's nothing. No. You know, if you got it, no. you, that's it. That's and it. it. And, and once you get it, it's not going to get better as you go. That's why I went from eight symptoms to, to 12, thir 12 and a half. Because <laughs> sometimes I drift off from that 13th. But um, it's, it's horrible, man, because it's like uh, I had an attack here recently. Uh, I say recently, probably about three, four weeks ago. Mm -hmm. And, and, man, you hallucinate. Um, you have hallucinations because yeah. of the concussions? Yeah. Now, what would happen? Well, at, this, at this point, you know. Mm -hmm. I mean, like, to give you an example, one time I told a story about a bowling alley. <laughs> well, here we go. <laughs> <laughs> now, but, the races. <laughs> but that, that, in that time frame, um, I was sitting around the house, my house, and I am lived out in the country in Alabama right now. That ain't going to last much longer. But... Um, you know, there's nobody really, because of the COVID thing, nobody's visiting people. And, you know, I've not been throwing any of the wild parties with the women. And so everybody's kind of just settled in there. At first, it was it was decent. You know, it was nice and quiet and peaceful. And, you know, to train and focus on certain things. Then after a while, it's like, damn, this is getting boring as shit. Yeah. And uh, that's, that's about where it's at now. But so a few weeks ago, I was sitting there. I have a lot of playtime with my cat, Swaggy, um, and, and, you know, he's, he's we, we bonded close because, hell, we're the only two moving things except for when he looks outside at the birds and stuff. Um, but he, he'll, uh, you know, we play with each other and he'll attack me, I'll attack him, you know, calm and stuff. But I was sitting there, and, and just like what the attorney said, you, when it's happening, you don't realize, you don't know those mood swings because you're in it. Same thing with a hallucination. They seem as real as can be. Uh, Swaggy came up to me and, and started talking to me in English. 
And you had a, a hallucination that your cat came well, up? Well, I didn't know. I was thinking he was talking English to me, and I was like... You really it got to that point? You thought the cat was yeah, talking yeah, to you? Yeah, he was really? talking to me. I mean, he was wow. talking to me, and I'm like, oh, that's cool, man. Are you all right? I think, you know, and he was answering, and we carried on the conversation. Jesus. And, you know, I was, I was just, it, it, it didn't dawn on me, like, man, something's wrong. It was just like it was natural. It was just like, shit, I didn't know you could talk English. <laughs> that's, that's, that's all it was. And uh, it wasn't until I called my brother, Gino, I called him and uh, told him, it was like a day later or something. Uh, I called and told him, I said, um, hey, man, uh, you need to get over here. Because where I stay is right by Fort Benning. They do a lot of military training. Uh, and he goes, what's the matter? And he could hear it in my voice. I said, what's the matter? Calm down. I said, there's a helicopter. Fort Benning, they, they've landed a helicopter in the front yard. And, you know, I got trees all out there. You couldn't even get a damn drone in there. But, um, yeah, he, he just got quiet because he knew. He knew. As soon as he heard that, he knew, oh, okay, he's going through one of his CTE things. And uh, he wasn't saying much. And I'm like, man, get over here. I don't know. They're just sitting there. He goes, what are they doing? They're just sitting there on that CB thing talking. They ain't got out. They're just sitting there. And I'm seeing it plain as day. It ain't like, you know, fog and, and you see through it like a ghost. It's there. And, and then, so he finally, he says, Marty, you're hallucinating again. I said, no, it's there, Gino, it's right there. This military, it's, it's them, a military company, they must be practicing shit. I don't know why they're here. You know, I was all panicked. There was a helicopter sitting there. And he said, well, take a picture of it and send it to me. So I said, okay, I will in a second, but stay on the phone with me, don't, don't. And then finally I said, hold on, I'll call you right back. So I took a couple shots. And I look at them and like, see which one's blurry. And, and what, there ain't nothing there but the yard. <laughs> you know, it, is, wow. it was nothing, that's when I like, Shit, I'm going through it again. And, and the thing is, when you, uh, you don't know how long it's going to last. Like, even like then I realized, okay, I'm hallucinating. Then I thought back, like, okay, and Swaggy probably wasn't really talking to me. You know, but, but you don't know how long it's going to last, and you have no concept of time. Three days could be like three hours. Wow. And, and, and you know, the other thing that happened was that uh, I was sitting there talking, to the Grim Reaper was sitting on one, like the bigger couch, and I'm on the, what they call it, love seat, or mm -hmm. small chair couch, I mean. You actually thought the no, image, he was actually he was there, really? I was sitting there talking to him, and he was nice, we had a few laughs, and, and you know, finally I got up, I, I even said, let me take a picture of you, he goes, like, yeah, sure, go ahead. Took a picture, I thought it was cool that he was sitting there on my couch. <clears throat> and I got, went, got hungry, I wanted to go get a sandwich, and I asked him, you want anything to eat? He goes, no. Nah. I went and made sandwich and I come back and he was gone. And first thing I, I was like disappointed. I was like, man, he didn't even say bye. You know, and I was kind of, you know, I'm by myself again, me and Swaggy. You know, I had company for a minute. So then I look at the pictures and nothing but the couch. And I'm like, ah, damn, I'm hallucinating again. And this is like day four or five. I mean, how long does it, you know, when you go through? It's like a fog. This lasts you, for days? It can. And it comes it and goes? Yeah, really? This one's probably the longest one. It went like five days. Wow. And, and, but you couldn't, for me, I can't speak for the other guys, drift in and out of them. Um, you're in it. It, it, it. it comes a point where you don't know what's real reality and what's a hallucination. Really? You know, wow. because it all seems real. The, uh, the hallucinations, when they're happening, real as hell. I mean, it's really happening. You're seeing it. Hell, if I'm taking a picture of it, I must be, you know, seeing it. Do but, you, um, are there times that you have a break where you seem of clear mind, or is it always... Once you hit that fog, but you think you're clear-minded while you're in yeah, the fog. Yeah. You, know, you don't know the difference. Another thing that, that's happened maybe in the last six months, eight months, is um, I'll be walking through the house with a smile on my face. Just got through watching some funny stuff from Ridiculousness or, or you know some kind of fun thing on TV. Smile. And, and overcome with the emotion of sadness. And, and I mean a tear, not not a not not that, but it, like tears will come down, like like somebody you just lost your best friend, but there's nothing nothing happened, nothing's wrong. And uh, you know I've talked to I'm not going to say their name because they 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 said and I really wanted on this because I respect them, uh, and they they didn't want nobody to know, but I was talking to them and uh, telling them what was going on. Um, they played football and you know wrestled. That's the only hint you get. <laughs> um, I would say I've been to the studio, but I'm not going to say that. But the, but the um, you know, pretty tough guy that you know doesn't want nobody knowing that this thing about him. He's private, kind of private, you know. So that's why I ain't going to say the name. But um, <clears throat> he, I told him about you know 
this CTE thing, man. I'd be walking through the house as happy as can be, and then all of a sudden, you actually feel the emotion coming over you, hmm. and it goes right to sad, and, and I mean, tear. I mean, it's so sad that you, 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 you got tears coming out of your eyes, and you don't know why. You're like, well, there's nothing wrong, but the emotion of sadness is it's there. It's real, very real. It's just like if my dad had just died, that emotion that, that I felt at that time, same thing, that emotion's right there, but there's, there's nothing wrong. You, you, you're like, well, you know, we have to put it out there. Well, and, and, and what I was just going to say with the guy I was talking, telling him about the phone, <laughs> it's going to make me cry again. Boy, I get emotional, don't I? Um, he started a little bit crying on the phone with me. Wow. And well, he this said, is someone that understands. He, well, he said, he goes, Marty, I do it all the time, too. And he goes, don't you tell nobody. So that's why I don't want to say the name. No, you got to respect the health yeah. situation. And, but he, he, I don't know if he's embarrassed about it or, or I mean, I'm not really that embarrassed about it. If I'm telling y'all, you know, hey, it is what it is. 30 years of trying to please y'all, bouncing my head off the floor has led to this. But I, but I just saying, um, and I was, that was kind of selfish. I do please myself too, late at night. What? Uh, well, I'll just look at the T-shirt. Uh, yeah. <laughs> but I think it's important. But yeah, he, 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 him, and one other guy that, that I, I won't say either, because those guys want to stay private with their. Sure. You know that's. Uh, but they do the same well, thing with the emotion. Is, absolutely. I mean, you know, when you when you walk and smiling through the house, and then all of a sudden, you the just bust cloud out crying. I mean, and there's several of us doing it, so it's it's not like oh, okay, that's just your case. Nah, this is his case and his case. Not that, that I not that I can compare what you've gone through, but it, when I had that accident with the Sheik, I had a bad case of post concussion syndrome for probably about a year. I remember one time I took a thing of orange juice out of the refrigerator and I started to pour it. I didn't have a cup. I mean, I, just <laughs> weird things that would, yeah. would come about. I, I'm better now. And, and it's weird because because like you you catch yourself like. What the and fuck I'm am looking I doing? I'm, as I'm still pouring. I'm like, wait a minute. Yeah, what the I don't have I a doing? cup, and I'm still. I still didn't think to tip it up. Right, because you know? it's, you're in that moment. It's, yeah. it's yeah. just it's surreal. You Chris know? Nowinski was very a good person to talk to when I was going through that because he understood. He went through it himself. Yeah. And for, whether it's you or any of the boys that may have been watching these programs of the Brotherhood, Dr. David Reese, who's the president of our organization, he's an acclaimed psychiatrist. He works with not only wrestlers but many professional athletes and their families out west in California and, and normal folk. Uh, he's... To the Brotherhood of Professional Wrestling, is always willing to extend a hand at no cost. Uh, you can contact us confidentially via email, and we'd be happy to set you up on that. Uh, again, this has been a very interesting episode, Marty. Sometimes we go from these crazy stories on the road. <laughs> Sometimes we talk about the brothers that we've lost here, real-life situations that yep. the guys are going through. Uh, so I think, that again, I don't want to, at this point, segue into more wrestling talk. I think this kind of episode should stand on its own. Yeah, yeah, let the CT, you know, uh, yeah. and... and, and you know, the NFL went through theirs, you know, the, the big lawsuit. Mm -hmm. uh, I think they lost two billion. Couple billion. Couple uh, billion, yeah. Off that thing. And now they've taken the precautions. Um, you know, WWE's going through it, whether or not it sticks or not. Um, probably be kind of hard when the, your best friend's the president. <laughs> I tell you, you know, I look at it like this. I think it's a great thing what WWE is doing now with the precautions they're taking yeah, they for are. their young talent, their training. Yeah. But why leave the vets in the position they're in. Now, you look at the law. I know you don't want to talk about the lawsuit, but just when I look at it, I say this. Did all those guys' bodies, probably 99% of them, honestly go through that? Yes. I think the problem it's going to come in the end is how do you prove that it happened in WWE? Like Matt Bourne, for example, he was in it. He yeah. wrestled two years of his career in WWE out of probably, what, 30 or so. Yeah, but you know what What they say, uh, what mm -hmm. I found out, um, I mean, they're still learning daily. Yeah, you know? Nick, yeah. Nick will tell you, there's still a lot. Um, but they are, they are making some advancements. And uh, somebody was telling me, one of my girlfriends were telling me um, that, or they wouldn't just study on it. That they now can do the, the cat scan. Yeah. And tell if it fairly accurately, you know, if you, if you got a bad case or you got it or whatever. And uh, you know, that was that's advancement because before you couldn't find out until after you're dead. They have to you know, go into your brain. Right. And so many of the guys are donating their brains now to try and help. If I had any, I would. Um, <laughs> but but you know, and, and and the thing what I was gonna say out of that was that. Um, it can take one huge bump to the head, 
you develop that bruise. It's a bruise, basically. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that's what it is and, to the brain. Uh, you know, as I, I always say, taking the egg, you know, raw egg, and shaking it real hard, that egg yolk house, and beating us, our heads do in the wrestling world. Um, but but just one big one, car wreck or anything, can can cause it or the accumulation, which most of them are f through accumulation. It was almost like a car wreck for you every night. <laughs> yeah. Especially with some of the guys. And they, they say, oh, it's fake. I got, you know, as far as in the ring or even like around, I think I've gotten knocked out maybe three times. Mm -hmm. One of them, Kevin Nash, was over in uh, England, I believe, London. Mm -hmm. um, well, one of the, somewhere on the European tour, probably England. Big ass stadium, I mean, not stadium, uh, arena, about 20, 15,000 people. Um, but he was he was still getting over with his uh, diesel, the diesel thing, and he had me and and it, you know when he did his, his thing out this side he was getting a power bomb and that was the first time I'd taken it from him. Uh, so I don't know if I oh, over rotated, rattled. but I don't think I did. I, th I think I didn't have no choice but to over rotate. Uh, but we got we got me up, bam, uh, man, my head dribbled and, and then next thing I know um, I'm laying there. I must have my eyes crossed because I was seeing Joey Morella, God rest his soul. Um, he's he's looking down at me and uh, and I'm like looking. There's like three or four of them like shaking my head, and, and I'm like, "What's going on, man?" He goes, "Dude, you got knocked out." And and that one, and then there was a time with a uh, cue ball and eight ball. Or who were the, the the brothers? The, the Blue Brothers. The Blue Brothers. The Harris boys. Yeah, Harris and them. Uh, me and Al Snow had a match. That's the only time I kind of got upset at Vince once. Um, I mean, for a personal reason, not like the continuing the show with Owen or anything like that. Um, they shot me in for that finish where they, they each get a leg and then bam, mm -hmm. knocked me out. <laughs> I mean, I'm looking up and the lights are blurry. It was really blurry anyway, but they're like super blurry. And Al, it's, it's Monday Night Raw, I think it was. Uh, yeah, pretty sure it was because it's a live show, right? right. And, and I'm laying there and, you know, I'm not sure what's going on yet. And Al's helping me. He's like, come on, let's get to the side. Come on. So he scooped me to the side. He goes, I think he got knocked out. And I, boy, I was like woozy on the whole walk back to the back. And uh, as soon as you get through the curtains, there was some mats rolled up, the roll up kind, uh, like the wrestling match, amateur mm -hmm. wrestling matches. That's, and, and I laid right on top of that and was just like just trying to get it together. And Vince comes through and he stops and he gives me the dirty ass, I mean, horrible look. And I'm like, what the hell? And then I find out later he thought that I was overselling. I was t uh -oh. in his live TV. So yeah. I was screwing up the, the timing. Uh, the next day at Nassau Coliseum in Long Island, New York, uh, coming in, we we're coming in together and he's, he comes up and he goes, I guess you was really hurt yesterday. I said, yes. <laughs> He goes, well, I apologize, I didn't know. And, and that was it, I mean, that was the end of that. But that was a, a brutal knockout. <laughs> wow. Uh, the only other time was in Japan when I was working with a light heavyweight champion and done something where they had a flip over the top rope out to the, to the outside, which he had moved and, and it was somebody's either sweat or something was still on the floor. And we had like, like this thing, concrete, we didn't have the mats around yet. And man, it slid, bam, that railing, the metal railing. Yeah, I saw about 13 of him. Oh, my God. <laughs> but so, yeah, well, all those accumulations, when you get knocked out, that's, you know, concussions. Absolutely. I, I think we are running out of time on this episode, fans, without a shadow of a doubt. Uh, please stop the drivers. All right. Well, wrestling fans, we're running out of time. We got a top secret message sent that way, Marty. Uh, CTE, is that in the club for tonight? There you go. CTE is a serious thing. Yeah, it is. We implore you, check out all the great work that Chris Nowinski is doing with his foundation, yes. based right here in Boston. And again, any athletes, especially that the, the veterans of this sport, they mean a lot to me personally for what they've dedicated to the, this genre. Dr. David Reese, if you want to Google him, he's available at no cost to you if you ever need someone to talk to. We mean that very sincerely. Again, wrestling fans, we thank you for joining us every Thursday night. It's an adventure. We laugh, we have fun, and then sometimes we hit the serious notes. For my partner in crime, Marty Janetti, I'm Dan Marotti. Don't forget, Tuesday night, it's Tony Atlas, Wrestling Insiders at 9. Marty will be back next Thursday at 9. Check us out on social media, and you and yours, be well, stay healthy. Good night. Rock it.